Good evening, and thank you for joining us for our midweek Bible study. I'm Todd Clifford, preacher for the Burleson Church of Christ in Hamilton, Alabama. We thank you for joining us in our midweek study. For those that have joined us for our live stream and those that will watch afterward, we want you to know how much we appreciate uh, your watching, your viewing, your studying with us, and we pray that our time together this evening will be profitable uh, to all of us, and most of all, that it will glorify and, and and uh, uplift uh, the name of God. We have a few housekeeping matters to take care of for our folks um, at Burleson and, and in our community. Uh, with regard to uh, some of our uh, extended family members, um, uh, Naomi's great niece Annie went home this week. She'd had, um, I don't remember if it was a blood marrow, a, a bone marrow transplant or a stem cell transplant, but uh, uh, she's a, a young lady still in her, she's in her late teens and uh, uh, fighting cancer and we're thankful she was able to go home today. We want to keep her uh, in our prayers. Also, uh, uh, Naomi's sister uh, uh, is continuing to improve um, among our local folks. Dennis continues uh, to improve. We want to keep him in our prayers following his surgery. And also, um, uh, today was, uh, for lack of a better term for mom, today was ground zero. Uh, all of her white counts and red counts in her blood are at zero. And so now they're going to uh, give her some uh, assistance to help her begin to rebuild her blood. Uh, she'll also uh, receive uh, her childhood vaccinations and, and all the things that she's received through the years. I mean, she's, uh, it's interesting all this, how it just completely wipes out. Uh, everything you've ever done and starts back uh, from scratch but she was very tired today Rhonda and I spoke with her uh, for about three or four minutes and all she was doing was sitting up it was uh, quite tiresome for her and so uh, we didn't we didn't keep her long but uh, uh, it's gonna be a rough uh, several days for her and hopefully uh, you know around the first of the week uh, things will begin to turn around for her and uh, she'll uh, continue or start and then continue to gain strength and I'm just so thankful for all of you that have sent her cards and uh, so many of you uh, have sent uh, notes of people that she doesn't you know, even really know. And um, it just means so much to her and uh, it means so much to us and my family. And we're thankful for, for all of you uh, for what you uh, continue to do for her. Um, also on a, a sad note, uh, we make mention of the, the passing of uh, Brother Kenneth Moore, uh, Hamilton Congregation, uh, passed away on Monday uh, while vacationing down in Florida, and uh, he is, his body has been returned uh, home, and his viewing will be tomorrow, that will be Thursday, from 10 o'clock in the morning until 1 o'clock in the afternoon at the Marion County Funeral Home, and his service will be at 1 o'clock at the Marion County Funeral Home. So uh, I want to keep... Uh, his kids and grandkids, that uh, their families, uh, in our prayers. A, a very good man, um, and um, just a, a great supporter of Maywood Camp, and and uh, helped us with the work Burleson did for the camp a number of years ago. Uh, so we uh, we mourn his loss, and we pray for uh, his widow, and we pray for all those uh, that also mourn uh, his loss. So. Um, and there, I know there are some others I'm probably forgetting. I'm not good at making notes right before we get on the air. So uh, let's just go ahead and pause for a moment. We'll have um, a word of prayer. And then after uh, that, we'll get into our study tonight. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for uh, this day. We're thankful for the sunshine and the rain you've given us over the last few days. Uh, we pray that you will continue to uh, give us those things that uh, you see that we need. Father, help us in our, in our own uh, desires to desire what is uh, uh, better or best for, for all or at least most and not to consider ourselves and our own personal desires as we as we come before your throne. Uh, Father, we pray that uh, as we come before your throne that the things that we may request may be the, uh, only the things that we need and, and, we, and, and that we, that we uh, have in our hearts. And we pray uh, always that your will be done because we know that you know better to give than we know how to ask. Father, we pray for all those that we've mentioned tonight uh, as being sick. We're thankful for the progress of others. Uh, and then, Father, we pray for uh, the Moore family. Uh, we're thankful for 
uh, Mr. Kenneth and, and his life and his example. We're pr uh, thankful for the good that has been done uh, in the kingdom and in our community. And we pray, uh, we just, uh, we pray for his wife and we pray uh, for all the kids and, and the grandchildren and ask your blessings on them in this difficult time. Father, we ask that you would be with us as we study your word tonight. Help us to be mindful of the truths uh, that are contained in thy word and how they uh, apply to us. And may we uh, take the things that we study and uh, let them sink deep into our hearts that uh, they might uh, mold us and change us, that we might be conformed more to the image of your son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, as announced on um, on Facebook, and uh, you can see probably in the in the heading of this of this live stream, our subject tonight is the demons religion. The demons religion. This old uh, old sermon, and uh, one that uh, struck me, I thought, as being uh, particularly helpful uh, in time past, and so I thought I would share it with you uh, tonight. And uh, you know, we sometimes refer to. <laughs> But well, let me put it this way: When I was a kid, I'm sure that the phrase "little demon" was used a lot, and not in a complimentary way. And uh, we might say somebody has a demon. And by the way, I do not believe in demonic possession today. I don't believe there's any biblical support for it. So when I talk about being a little demon or, or calling someone a demon, whatnot, or to speak of being demon possessed, I mean it in uh, in a colloquial way. Uh, and not in a theological way. And so said, we'll make sure we get that clear from the, from the outset. But, you know, there are some things that we can read about demons in our New Testaments that are certainly worthy of our, not only our study, uh, but of emulating. And you wouldn't think that, you wouldn't think that, uh, that a demon would have any redeeming quality, and yet there are some things that we can know about demons uh, from the biblical text, I think that uh, would prove helpful to us uh, in our own uh, walk, in our own spiritual growth and development. And so I want us to think a little bit, what we'll do is we'll, we'll look at about five things uh, tonight that pertain to the demon's religion, the demon's religion, and then take those five things and make application for ourselves and then draw just a uh, a few brief conclusion or cl concluding thoughts and points for consideration. But number one, the demons' religion uh, can be emulated. Number one, because the demons believe in God. In Isaiah uh, chapter 29 and verse 16, it says, Shall the thing that is made say to the thing that made it, you made me not? And the point of making mention of that verse is because all things... Uh, in heaven and in earth are made uh, outside of outside of the Godhead um, itself or Himself, however you want to how you want to identify it, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Those at that time, the Father and the Word and the Holy Spirit. Those three persons are eternal, uh, going in all directions, including backwards. Other than that, there is nothing that is eternal. So therefore, every angel is a created being. Every demon is a created being. And we know a little bit from the scriptures that demons uh, are fallen angels who did not, as Jude uh, verse 6 and 2 Peter 2 verses 4 and following, they did not uh, keep their original estate. Um, they, uh, uh, they sinned, as Peter said, and were cast into chains of darkness. But the truth of the matter is that demons do believe uh, in God. Uh, Colossians 1 and verse 16 also teaches us that they are the product of uh, God's creation. In James chapter 2 and in verse number 19 is probably the, what we might say, the, the, the cornerstone verse for this idea. <clears throat> where James is talking about the need for faith and works, that faith without works is dead. And by the way, even though the scripture doesn't say it in this text, we can also say that works without faith is dead. We talked a little bit about that idea with regard to the matter of regeneration and that study uh, last Sunday night. But uh, in the discussion of faith and works in verse 19, James says, you believe there is one God, 
You do well. Now, that's, by the way, that's sarcasm. That's sarcasm. You do well. He goes, even the demons believe and tremble. And so there are many who would profess that they believe in God. But James says, even the demons believe in God and they tremble at the thought of God. And so when we, talk, when we think about the idea that the demons believe in God, I mean, they obviously, having been in the presence of God, they believe in God. Now having suffered in, in a limited way, temporary way, the wrath of God, they tremble at the thought of God. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself to, to the application and the, and the conclusion. You know, but how many people profess to believe in God, yet the thought of God does not move them at all, much less make them tremble? So the demons, the demons religion is a religion uh, that uh, believes in God. But then number two, and by the way, this also includes the devil, Matthew 4, uh, verses 1 through 11. We know the devil believes in God. The account of Job uh, teaches us that, that uh, the, the devil believes uh, in God, is conversant with and uh, familiar uh, with God. But then secondly... We have some interesting statements from the early days of the ministry uh, of Jesus and also from the apostles. And that is this, number two, is that the demons readily confessed that Jesus was the Lord, that Jesus is Lord. In uh, Mark chapter 1 and verse uh, 24, a demon is recorded as saying, you are Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of God. Matthew 8 and verse 29. You are Jesus, you Son of God. Mark 3 and verse 11. You are the Son of God. And over and over again we find that the demons readily professed that Jesus was the Son of God and uh, confessed Him as Lord. And so, uh, and by the way, this was not... Um, this was not some uh, mindless, rote um, confession. This was a genuine statement of faith. And I think when you look at the context in which these confessions are found, that it's really a plea for mercy. And we do see in other accounts, that, for example, the account of Legion um, in Mark chapter 5. That, uh, that the demons were, were pleading for mercy, uh, at least a temporary respite uh, from, uh, from uh, their torment. And so, so the demons freely confessed that Jesus is the Lord. He's the Son of God. But then, number three, we note this. The demons are subject to God's authority. The demons are subject to God's authority. In other words, every time Jesus spoke to a demon and told that demon, for example, when he's speaking to a demon, he would be speaking to a person possessed by a demon or multiple demons, again, as in the case of Legion. That when Jesus cast out those demons, you know, in other words, physically, verbally told them to get out. They could not resist his authority. In other words, they could not refuse him. Now, it's not because they couldn't confuse, refuse him because they had no free will. It's they could not refuse him because they knew exactly who he was and they knew the power and the authority that he possessed. And then Mark 1 and verse 24, for example, we already read from verse 24 where the demons confessed that he was Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of God. And how did Jesus respond to that? Be quiet and come out of him. Be quiet and come out of him. What did that demon do? He was quiet and he came out of him. In Matthew 8, again, the confession from verse 29 uh, uh, says, let us go 
into the herd of swine. Of course, that's the, the parallel account uh, of Mark with the account uh, we call Noah's the matter of legion. But again, permit us to go into the swine. In other words, they had to even ask permission to leave a human form and enter into an animal form. In Job 1 and Job 2, and also in uh, 1 Corinthians 10 uh, and verse 13, we understand that even the devil is subject to the authority of God. You remember in Job chapter 1 when, when, the, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and the devil was with them and, and of course the exchange goes that there's no, none on earth like Job. And the devil says, well, why doesn't, why wouldn't Job serve you? You've basically given him the mightest touch. Everything he touches turns to gold. You, you've made him richer than any man alive. And, well, anybody would serve you under those conditions. So he said, you take away what he has, and he'll quit following you. So what did God say? He said, you go, and all that he has is in your power, but you cannot touch him. And the devil was bound by those words. And then in the next case, the devil said, Skin for skin, a man will give anything on the account of his health. And God said, Now you can touch his flesh, but you cannot kill him. The devil again went out, subject to the authority of God. And so over and over again, we see that the demons and even the devil himself is subject to the authority of of God, and that the demons are subject to those who wield the authority of God. Uh, for example, in the case of the demoniac in the book of Acts, the, the, the demon-possessed girl, and she accurately stated of Paul and his company, these are men of God who show us the way of salvation. And, and, and then, of course, Paul, they cast uh, that demon... Uh, from that girl and the, the, her, her handlers, so to speak, uh, became quite displeased because uh, their hope of getting gain from this uh, poor young woman's misfortune uh, had dissipated, disappeared, and it caused trouble for the apostles. But again, note, the demon, the demon-possessed girl uh, accurately, accurately made reference to Paul and his company what they were doing, and then yet still were subject to the authority wielded by those apostles. And so the demons are subject to God's authority. But then number four, we learned that even the demons worship Jesus. In Mark 5 and verse 6 in the account of Legion, uh, that uh, this was one who, who could not be contained. Uh, he, could not, you know, he could not be handled. And what do we find? That he comes and falls down and, and, and he prostrates himself before it says he worshipped him, which means he, he fell down at his feet and honored and venerated the Son of God. The, the demons are worshipers of deity. And so certainly that would be a, something to be emulated. You know, belief in God, confession uh, of Jesus Christ, being in subjection to the authority of God and worshiping God. And then lastly, here's number five I want us to think about just briefly. Even the demons acknowledge the judgment. Even the demons acknowledge the judgment. Remember when they said to him, have you come, said to Jesus, have you come to torment us before the time? Have you come to torment us before the time? In other words, we know that there is a punishment for us that lies ahead. But have you come now early to get, in other words, have you come to get an early start on this punishment and that they acknowledge that they were due, that they, that they deserved? Uh, in uh, 2 Peter 2 and uh, verse uh, number 4, it says that God did not spare the angels that sinned, but cast them down into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And so the demons acknowledge that there's going to be, uh, there's going to be a judgment day. And so now 
Having given that consideration, we ask just a handful of questions. The, the, the overall theme is, is my religion as good as that of the demons? So I've asked the first question. The demons believe in God. Do I? Do I really believe in God? In Hebrews 11 and verse 6, it says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who would come to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In John 6 and verse number 29, Jesus said, This is the work of God, that you believe in him uh, uh, whom he has sent. Now, that does not mean that faith itself is a direct gift from God apart from the ascent of a human being. Because in verse 28, the question was asked of Jesus, what must we do that we might work the works of God? In other words, we want to know what God requires of us. And in response, Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Then in response, they said, well, what work are you going to do whereby we can, where we can believe in you? And so the entirety of that exchange denies the direct operation of the Holy Spirit or the direct gift of faith in that the construction of working the works of God, this is the work of God, the construction of those phrases is, is identical. And so, uh, and so but we, we learned that God requires that we believe in Him and that we believe in His Son. And then secondly... The demons confess that Jesus is the Lord. Then the question, do, have I confessed and do I continue to acknowledge that Jesus is the Lord? In the first uh, gospel sermon preached in the name of the resurrected Christ in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, or the, of Peter says, that God has raised up this same Jesus whom you have crucified. He says he's made him both Lord and Christ, verses 35 and 36. And so the, the first gospel sermon uh, preached there on the day of Pentecost was a, a sermon that required one uh, to confess that Jesus was Lord and Christ. In Romans chapter 10 and verses 9 and 10, and I'll read this just to make sure I get it exactly right. It says, for if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Then verse 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have I and do I acknowledge him as the Lord? Do my uh, actions acknowledge Him as the Lord? Does my speech acknowledge Him as the Lord? Number three, the demons are subject to God's authority. And we know that because they obeyed when they were given command. So in like fashion, am I subject to God's authority? I think about John chapter 2 and verse 5 when Jesus was at the wedding feast of Cana. And they had run out of wine. And, and what are we going to do? And, and Jesus' mother had confidence that Jesus would, would basically save the day, so to speak. And here's what she said to the servants. And, and, and this is great advice. Whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says to you, do it. And I think I've, got, I've written a sermon by, by that title, Whatever He Says to You. Do it. In John 14 and verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. He who keeps my commandments is he who loves me, he went on to say there in verses 21 and following. In Luke 6 and verse 46, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? And, and this is a statement made not to unbelievers, but to believers, to, to actual disciples. It is uh, it is the, the parallel to Matthew 7, uh, 21 to 23. Uh, and it's couched in the, in the context of the Sermon 
on the mount. And so uh, as we think about the need to obey Jesus, it's not just a matter of a bunch of external things. It's a matter, it, the Sermon on the Mount begins on the inside. You know, the, be, to be poor in spirit, uh, to mourn, to be meek, to hunger and thirst after righteousness, to be, to be merciful, to be pure, to be a peacemaker, and be willing to be persecuted for righteousness sake. And so the, 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 the concept, the idea of obedience begins in, it begins in the heart. Uh, then number four, you know, the demons worshipped Jesus. Am I a worshiper? In John 4 and verse 23, the Bible says, God just doesn't seek worshipers. God seeks true worshipers. You know, there are a lot of worshipers of God. But there are very, very few true worshipers of God. For God is spirit, and those who worship him, they who worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. That is, our spirit, that is, our heart, in truth, with our actions. That uh, we must worship God with the proper attitude of heart, but yet what we do in our worship must also accord uh, with truth, which comes by uh, hearing God's word, John 17 and verse 17. And then number five, the demons acknowledge the judgment. Do I live my life in view of faith in the judgment? You know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of folks who profess to believe in the judgment day, but their lives sure do not back up what they're their words are or what their mouths say and do I believe in the judgment Hebrews 9 and verse 27 it is appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man for God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verses 13 and 14. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in our bodies according to that which we have done, whether it's good or whether it's bad. In Revelation 20 and verse 11, it says, I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things which were written in those books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to their to his works, and death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There will be a day of judgment. There will be a day of reckoning. But do I acknowledge, does my life acknowledge my faith in the fact that there is going to be a judgment? The very fact that God raised Jesus from the dead demands a judgment. In Acts 17 and verse 30, it says, These times of ignorance God once winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained and has given assurance unto all in that he has raised him from the dead. On the day of Pentecost, when those Jews heard and believed that Jesus was raised from the dead, they were convinced that they were not prepared for judgment. Which is why they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter responded in a way that you'll rarely hear anybody respond today. Here's what Peter said. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And so in view of the judgment and, and the righteous judgment of God, those that gladly received his word were baptized and were added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. Acts 2 and verse number 41. There will be a day of judgment. 
Three questions. Is my religion as good as the religion of the demons? Can I get to heaven with the religion of the demons? And what would it take for me to, what must I do in order for my religion to exceed that of the demons? I'm going to close with, with, this, with this one thought and we'll be done. Hell is a lot hotter than any of us can imagine. And eternity is a lot longer. And, and with that in mind, we would, we would plead with anyone who has not obeyed the gospel, or, and especially to any unfaithful Christian, someone who knows better than to leave the Lord and live like they're living. You know, 2 Peter 2, 20-22 says, It's better not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to have turned away from the holy commandment that's been delivered. And then it says, It's happened to them according to the true proverb, The dog has returned to his vomit, and the sow that was once washed to wallowing in the mire. So what a terrible thought. Those that knew not their master's will and did not prepare themselves will be beaten with few stripes, but those that knew the master's will and did not prepare themselves shall be beaten with many stripes, in Luke uh, 12, verses 47 and 48, for to whom much is given, much will be required. Is my religion better than the religion of the demons? I hope this has been a challenging and eye-opening and thought-provoking lesson and study for you this evening. We thank you for joining us in this period of Bible study. If the Lord wills, on, uh, on this coming Lord's Day, at 10 o'clock, we'll be assembled here at the Burleson Church, and we'll be live streaming uh, the entirety of our worship service. If you're local and you would like to join us, we'd love to have you. And if you uh, have opportunity to watch us on the live stream or afterward, we uh, welcome everyone to watch. And we welcome your comments, uh, either in the thread or you can, you can message me privately. We like to hear from those that are watching the program. We're going to uh, close with a word of prayer. And then after that, we'll be finished for the evening. Again, our Father, we thank you for this day. And we're thankful for our freedom. We're thankful for our nation. We're thankful for the protections that we uh, now enjoy to, to be assembled and to worship thee, the only living and true God. Father, we pray your blessings on our country, knowing that there's so much uh, strife and difficulty uh, throughout. We know that there's so much uh, wickedness and, and even uh, uh, iniquity and evil uh, sanctioned by our governing authorities. And Father, we, uh, we pray that as a nation that we might uh, move back toward uh, the principles, not only on which this nation was founded, but that we might move back toward the principles uh, that are found uh, in your holy and divine uh, word. Father, help us, to, as, help us as individuals uh, to live lives uh, of purity uh, and holiness. Help us to let our light shine to those uh, that are round about us. And Father, forgive us uh, wherein we fail you in any, in any respect. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. Lord willing, we'll look for you this coming Lord's Day morning at 10 o'clock.